three uh, special presenters today, two strikingly familiar and one special guest from beyond the walls. So I'm especially excited about that. And then we'll have a prayer and I'll hand it over to them. proceed as follows. Each of us will take uh, up to 15 minutes to give a presentation. Uh, any time remaining, if we stop short, we can have some questions for clarification. And then after we're all done, we'll, I assume we'll be sitting here. Uh, I saw the chairs, so that's a reasonable inference. Now, there are other theologians in the world besides John Wesley. I'm aware of that. But, uh, and I don't want you to get the impression, uh, which I might have conveyed thus far, that Wesley is somehow my only theological touchstone. Actually, there are a good number of others, but I am going to talk about John Wesley this morning, his vision for Christian unity. And uh, I don't have a handout. I don't have a fancy presentation like Leander does. Uh, I'm just <laughs> delivering a condensed version of a paper I gave a couple years ago. So I'll try to keep it as lively as I can, and, and I think you'll be able to try. In his 1750 sermon, uh, Catholic spirit, John Wesley grapples with the question of Christian unity. He also explores this same topic in his 1749 letter to a Roman Catholic. That's also worth reading. Wesley takes for his text 2 Kings 10.15, an interchange be between Yehonadab, son of Rahab, and Yehu, king of Israel. Yehu asks Yehonadab, is your heart right, as my heart is with your heart? If it is, give me your hand. Wesley sees Yehu's example as, quote, well worthy both the attention and imitation of every serious Christian. In his mind, he presents a portrait of Christian unity, a unity unrealized because of secondary differences of opinion and practice. Wesley laments the fact that Christians are not united. According to Wesley, Christians are prevented from enjoying love for one another because of two basic barriers. First, they can't all think alike meaning that they hold real differences of theological opinion. Second, and consequently, they can't all walk alike. That is, their theological differences are reflected in their differing church practices. But in Wesley's view, these differences should not prevent Christian unity. And here's an illustrative quote from Wesley. But although a difference in opinions or modes of worship may prevent an entire external union, Yet need it prevent our union in affection? Though we can't think alike, may we not love alike? May, not, may we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without all doubt, we may. Herein, all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding their smaller differences. These remaining as they are, they may encourage one another in love and good works. Wesley's convinced that Christians can be united to one another in love, to be of one heart, even while they remain externally separated from one another by differences of theological opinion and church practice. In fact, Wesley believes that these external differences are inevitable, unavoidable, and should not be our primary concern when it comes to Christian unity. Well, why does Wesley think this? Wesley begins by drawing a sharp distinction between theological opinion and Christian doctrine. For Wesley, the term opinion refers to any intellectual inference we might draw from our perception of things, whatever those things might be. In the case of our theology, scripture and the cardinal doctrines of the Christian tradition are the objects of the Christian's perception. The authoritative teachings of the Christian religion in their own right, regardless of our opinions about them. By contrast, our theological opinions are the inferences we draw from our understanding of those doctrines. Differences of, of opinion about the central doctrines, which for Wesley are best captured in the ancient ecumenical creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, these are serious matters, differences of opinion on these central doctrines. There are right and wrong opinions when it comes to these matters. Indeed, to have a theological opinion that denies or substantially alters any of these central claims of the Christian faith may ultimately result in denial of the Christian faith. And so, Wesley says, to be very clear, 
a Catholic spirit is not a speculative latitudinarianism. You have to learn how to say latitudinarianism before you get your degree. It is not an indifference to all opinions. A man of a truly Catholic spirit is fixed as the sun in his judgment concerning the main branches of Christian doctrine. However, for Wesley, theological opinion also has a secondary reference. It also refers to judgments that involve what Wesley calls smaller differences. Theological differences that do not lie at the center of the Christian faith. Theological differences about non-central Christian teachings are of a secondary order and are not vital to Christian unity. In fact, Wesley holds that a diversity of theological judgments about non-critical doctrines will necessarily result from the limited process of human reasoning and the finite scope of fallen human understanding. Note that Wesley says, we can't think alike. That is, we are incapable of coming to identical intellectual judgments because of the limitations of fallen human reason. Yet it is necessary that we make judgments, that we draw conclusions, and so differences of theological opinion on secondary matters, matters are inevitable but they are not evil. It's for this reason, the inevitability of differing theological opinions, that Wesley insists upon toleration among believers concerning smaller points of theology. No person should think that his or her judgments, or the judgments of his or her denomination, regarding these secondary theological matters are infallible. And because unity of theological opinion is impossible, it's also impossible that common opinion should serve as a basis for Christian unity. Says Wesley, every wise man therefore will allow others the same liberty of thinking which he desires they should allow him. And no will, no will more insist on their embracing his opinions than he would have them to insist on his embracing theirs. He bears with those who differ from him and only asks him with whom he desires to unite in love that single question is your heart right, as my heart is with your heart? This same principle holds true of differences in Christian practice. Many of our differences in church practice flow directly out of our differing traditions of theological opinion. As with the variety of religious opinions, so Wesley insists that toleration should be maintained in respect to religious practices. For Wesley, these include such matters as which church one belongs to, forms of church government, forms of prayer, forms of the Lord's Supper, various ways of administrating baptism, etc. Well, having come this far, we begin to have a sense of the kind of unity that Wesley does not have in mind. In matters of theological opinion about non-essential things, he seeks to avoid a demand for absolute doctrinal uniformity on the one hand, and a negligent indifference toward doctrinal commitments on the other. His notion of unity preserves the freedom of the believer's conscience within the bounds of creedal orthodoxy. Likewise, in matters of church practice, Wesley seeks to avoid the extreme of slavish conformity to one, uh, on the one hand and excessive sectarianism on the other. In relation to our current ecumenical context, we might draw several inferences. First, Wesley appears wary of any demand for organic or structural unity between churches. He would take issue with any assertion that Christians cannot be in real unity as long as the, as the church is not visibly, sacramentally one. In Wesley's view, true Christian unity surpasses such ecclesial distinctions, no matter how significant those distinctions might be. Yet second, Wesley would most certainly object to any notion of unity that would deny a commitment to orthodox Christian doctrine concerning the revelation of God and Jesus Christ. Indeed, true Christian unity takes a common commitment to creedal Christian faith as one of its essential pre uh, prerequisites. Consequently, the notion in some contemporary ecumenical circles that historic Christian doctrine is somehow a barrier to unity it stands in direct opposition to Wesley's perspective. And in scathing rebuke of all such attitudes, he offers this great quote. Observe this, you who know not what spirit ye are of, who call yourselves men of a Catholic spirit only because you are of a muddy understanding, because your mind is all in a mist, because you have no settled, consistent principles, but are for jumbling all opinions together. 
Go first and learn the first elements of the gospel, the gospel of Christ. And then you shall learn to be of a truly Catholic spirit. Third, Wesley would also take issue with the spirit of autonomy and indifference displayed in many of our churches today toward ecclesial and congregational commitments. Wesley assumes that serious Christians will be committed to a particular tradition because they are convinced of the merits of that tradition as a faithful way of service to Christ. And it's this common commitment to Christ which stands as the basis of true unity. Well, with these points in view, what does it mean then to have a right heart, according to Wesley? And how does such a rightness of heart serve as a basis for Christian unity? How does it lead us to be of one heart? First, Rightness of heart, or what some call orthocardia, I love that term, <laughs> orthodoxy and orthocardi, orthocardia, <laughs> doesn't mean a depth of warm feeling that is indifferent to doctrinal matters, quite the contrary. Wesley's preeminent criterion for rightness of heart is that the heart is in right relation to God. And right relation is contingent upon right belief, which is necessary for faith. Thus Wesley asks, is thy heart right with God? Dost thou believe his being and his perfections, his eternity, immensity, wisdom, power, his justice, mercy, and truth? Hast thou a divine evidence, a supernatural conviction of the things of God? Dost thou walk by faith, not by sight? Wesley asks these same questions regarding belief in Jesus Christ. Belief, trust, and obedience in relation to Christ are all prerequisite to a heart that is right with God. It's only when Christ is revealed in the soul and formed in the heart by faith and becomes the only basis for the believer's righteousness that one can know the truth as it is in Jesus. That is prerequisite <coughs> to a right heart. In this respect, right heartedness is rooted in what Thomas Noble refers to as spiritual realism, the conviction of the real personal presence of Christ formed in the believer through the work of the Holy Spirit. However, in second, though a living faith is necessary, it's not alone sufficient for a heart that is right with God. The Christian must love God, for faith without love is dead. For Wesley, there's a transformation of the heart that should result from faith in Jesus Christ, a transformation that is the work of the Holy Spirit. It involves a reordering of the heart and its affections, a reordering that results in a newfound delight in God and in the things of God is this transformation, this reordering of love which, with which Wesley's mainly concerned. This is why he rejects shared opinion as a basis for Christian unity, why he's not particularly concerned about forms of worship or church membership. It's also why he sees mere faith, that is, mere right belief, as alone insufficient, though necessary, for Christian unity. Third, rightness of heart will be seen in a love of our neighbor, which is demonstrated through our attitudes and our actions. Thus, right-heartedness is a reordering of love that involves the entire person. Love for God and love for neighbor encompass all aspects of human life, intellectual and effective, volitional and behavioral, individual and social. For Wesley, this real condition of right-heartedness is the only sufficient ground of true Christian unity. Anything short of this is at best a unity of mere belief, not a unity rooted in a common faith, alive with love for God and neighbor. However, when such Christian right-heartedness is present, it establishes a foundation of mutual Christian love, a peculiar love, uh, that's, a, that's a phrase from Wesley, that can transcend differences of theological opinion and uh, ecclesial practice. In the remainder of his sermon, Wesley describes what is meant by give me your hand, what a Christian unity of heart that is rooted in right heartedness, how a Christian of, of a unity of heart that is rooted in right heartedness is worked out in practice. He begins by emphasizing the necessity of mutual Christian love. I'm going to speed up here so it's not to take up too much time. Um, if, if there is not mutual Christian love, then unity of heart, sorry, if there is mutual Christian love, then unity of heart is possible and can lead to a genuine unity of devotion and mission. This includes intercessory prayer for one another, especially prayer for growth and godliness. It involves mutual accountability 
to love and good works, an accountability which is willing to speak the truth in love. And finally, it involves cooperation with one another in service of God. These are just a few uh, examples of how this unity of heart can be worked out on the ground among, among Christians of varying denominations and uh, traditions. Well, a lot more can be said here that uh, time doesn't permit. Let me just conclude with two positive observations and two caveats. While Wesley stands in tension with contemporary ecumenism in important respects, he has made at least two important positive contributions. First, his commitment to Christian unity leads him to make a strong distinction between, distinction between essential and secondary matters of faith. He believes that many sources of disagreement are superficial and unnecessary impediments to unity. Such a perspective carries a profound critique of sectarianism in all its forms. Second, Wesley's emphasis upon the priority of love among Christians serves as a needed counterpart to his de-emphasis of secondary matters. Christian unity requires not only a willingness to set aside differences of theological opinion and ecclesial practice, it also requires a willingness to extend oneself in Christian love and spiritual friendship beyond the bounds of one's own theological and ecclesial circles. Um, I, I'm going to just jump ahead here. Uh, and wrap this up. I think finally it's worth underscoring that Christian unity need not require either theological uh, or, or institutional convergence from Wesley's perspective. Rather, it may be expressed in the form of cooperative works of love and service, especially within our local context. And I believe that Wesley would strongly affirm what some in our day refer to as a practical ecumenism, especially among Christians in local communities. Thank you very much. I discovered Leslie Newgood for the first time as a parish pastor being very concerned about apologetics and I read all of his great apologetic works like you know Foolishness to the Greeks and Open Secret and the, the Gospel of Pluralist Society. When I got to Trinity I was given an opportunity to teach a course on Leslie Newgood and I started to read the whole corpus and I started to read the earlier uh, missionary works and the earlier ecumenical works and uh, I, was, I had a conversion, and my, my conversion was a, a conversion to the significance of ecumenicity. Uh, and ecumenical is a word that's been trampled in our time. It kind of means a um, t uh, tepid liberal stew is kind of what the word has, uh, has, has come to mean in our, in our time. It's unfortunate. It means the whole house of God is what it really, is what it really means. And I began to see, reading Leslie Dumigan, the the connection between the unity of the church and the mission of the church, and how the unity of the church is the, if not the number one, one of the very significant strategic missionary issues of our time. Newbegin, um, and I can't remember the name of the Indonesian general, quoted an Indonesian general at an ecumenical conference, and the general said, um, uh, the great question is whether the West can be converted. And, 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 and Newbegin said, we cannot possibly reconvert the West from the platform of a divided Christianity, because it is a mode of the Christian faith that has already fatally accommodated itself to the consumer society. Okay. So the fact, this is a quote, the fact that for the majority of churchmen disunity does not appear to be an intolerable offense against the very nature of the church is due to the fact that we do not seriously believe that the church is what the New Testament says it is. So here's Leslie Newbing. He was born in 1909, lived to be until 1998, and was active right up until the very end. If you read only one book ever, in my view, if you read only one book about ecclesiology, about the theology of the church, this is the book that I would recommend. Uh, a set of lectures that Newbing gave in 1953 called The Household of God. It's a very short book. It's a very lucid book, like all of Newbing's writing is. And it is a very, a very uh, practical book. And these remarks I'm going to share with you are really drawn from that. So there's a the picture of the great man towards the end of his life. And uh, I think uh, Justin had a chance to meet him once. Yeah. So he was. He grew up in a Christian family. Uh, went to a to a Quaker boarding school and and kind of imbibed a fairly liberal uh, social justice oriented kind of uh, Christianity. He got a job in a Quaker camp that was dealing with 
what the British call redundant miners, which means that they've been they've been driven out of work, and uh, they were you know trying to give these uh, uh, poor guys a, a some holiday time at the seaside, and he was teaching them to play ping pong and other things like that, and the men smuggled goods into the camp, and a riot broke out, a fist fight, and a riot broke out. And Newbigin realized that his kind of uh, tepid fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man uh, message without the cross and without redemption left him with really nothing to say to these, to, these, uh, to these people. And he had a vision of the cross, and that was his conversion experience. So he goes out from uh, Scotland to uh, India as a reformed Presbyterian pastor. And something happens to him that becomes one of the uh, first bishops of the new United Church of South India. As a missionary, um, uh, he becomes aware of the scandal of Christian divisions for the effectiveness of the mission in this truly, this environment, which is a truly non-Christian environment. So, if Hinduism is a whole way of life, it's a whole culture. So, if you literally ask people to give up their mother and their father, and their family, and their whole way of life, and you tell them that the Son of God has come to reconcile all people uh, to the Father and to and to each other, so they come out and you're inviting them to come in to the church, which is supposed to be the down payment of the new reconciled humanity. And then you say, oh, by the way, we don't get along with the Lutherans down the block. <laughs> Just imagine the scandal in a small Hindu village where the, where the gospel comes. And shortly after the gospel comes, there's not one Christian congregation, but two or three or four Christian congregations. So very quickly, the missionaries develop this thing they call comedy, which is they say, the work, the, there's so few of us. And... Um, and, and the, work is, um, the work is so huge. Um, you know, the Lutherans work over here, the Congregationalists work over here, the Anglicans work, work over here, we'll respect each other, but we won't sort of steal sheep in each other's territory. Let's have a comedy. Well, what happens is you get baptized over here, and then you move over there for your work life. And so what, how are you received by that Christian congregation over there? So very quickly, comedy, they realize that comedy is not, a, is not an adequate uh, uh, strategy. And this leads to a process that takes almost 50 years to form uh, the Church of uh, South India uh, with um, Anglican uh, Congregationalists and I forget what, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian minister. So this is Newbigin's sort of formative experience. He then goes on to become a major figure in the World, the world Missionary Council and the World um, Council of Churches and really sees the World Council of Churches um, sees it inaugurated with great promise, guided by theologians like Karl Barth and Ewald Brunner and Reinhold Niebuhr and great people like that, and sees it at uh, T.F. Torrance, and, and sees it completely <coughs> lose, the, lose the plot, and sees uh, uh, the ecumenical agenda uh, uh, being replaced by an interfaith agenda that uh, really loses the distinctive focus on the reconciliation of Jesus Christ. That, Newbegin stresses over and over again, there is one place, there's an actual place, where God has determined to bring the human race together, and that is at the foot of the cross of Christ. So he's, he's, he's against any kind of ecumenism that would be doctrinally indifferent, especially about uh, the redemption that's in Jesus Christ. He's, he's, he's very much uh, opposed to a lowest common denominator, kind of, you know, as I say, weak stew sort of ecumenism. But on the other hand, he's opposed to what he calls cheap ecumenism. In the missionary setting, he's so deeply convinced of the significance of the visible unity of the Christians. It doesn't mean that there has to be one style. It doesn't necessarily mean that in a big city that there has to be only one congregation. There, there, but that somehow there's a visible unity, a visible, tangible, a palpable unity of all the Christians in one place confessing a common Lord uh, hearing a hearing a common gospel and participating in common sacraments, and w without that, without that visible unity, he thinks there's a uh, uh, well. We don't believe that the that the church is what the New Testament uh, says it is, which it is the one body of Christ. So sadly, the uh, 
the uh, uh, proposal for the um, Church of South India was viciously, rather viciously attacked both by uh, Anglican evangelicals and by Anglican uh, Anglo-Catholics, and it took over 20 years for the Church of South India to be accepted as a partner in the Anglican Communion. What I want to say is that this experience that the that Newbigin had, this searing experience of the embarrassment and the contradiction which a divided church is to the mission of the church, which was vivid for him because of his setting in a uh, strongly non-Christian uh, environment, that that reality is, if it is not already our reality, it is, it is soon to become our reality as the old Christian homelands become more and more secularized, neo-paganized, whatever, however you want to think about this, and actually hostile, uh, where the contrast between the church and the world becomes a brighter line all the time. Uh, this, the scandal and the embarrassment and the, uh, the missionary contradiction of a, of a, of a, of a divided church is, uh, becomes vivid, I think, for us in the, in the way that it was for Newbigin. So, um, Nubian wants to say that the missionary movement and the ecumenical movement are two sides of the same coin. And this is historically, I think, accurate, that out of the, out of the uh, Glasgow Conference, Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Edinburgh Conference, really comes the call for, for, for Christian unity. Uh, but he just sees that they're, theologically, they're two sides of the same coin. They're, 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 they're twin implications of the gospel. Mission, mission and unity are twin implications of the gospel. So he always wants to understand uh, the church in a missionary perspective, and he also wants to understand it in an eschatological perspective. And I'll talk about that a little bit further. One of the things Newbigin wants to say is that we can never define what the, we can't say what the church really is in terms of anything that exists now. Because it's, we, we, we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So the church we're looking for is not some version that exists now. The church that we're looking for is the, is, the, is, 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 is the church of the future that is being brought to us in the power of the Spirit. But um, he wants to criticize, he's an evangelical, but he wants to criticize evangelicals for their relative indifference to the visible church. And he's not very fond of this theolo theologian of the invisible church. He says the reason why we, we like the idea of the invisible church is that um, uh, we can make it, we can, we can define it the way we want. Uh, it's, uh, it's the church we prefer rather than the actual people that God is gathering together around his son. So the church is, he, in the New Testament, New Begin says the church is defined as the church of God or the church of Christ or the church of this locale. Right? So it's, it, it's God's church, it's Christ's church, or it's the church of Ambridge or Corinth or Ephesus. It's the proper way of thinking about the church. It's not a segregation, but a congregation. One of the things that is interesting about Newbegin's ecclesiology is he says that the reformers didn't go far, far enough. They recognized that the Christian person is simultaneously justified and a, and a sinner, but so is the church. And uh, Protestants try to deal with the sin of the church, evangelicals deal with the sin of the church by ascribing um, the, 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 you know, it, it's the invisible uh, church that's the real church, and that's the sinless church, right? Roman Catholics say, well, there might be sinners in the church, but the church, qua church, uh, can't sin. And uh, Newbegin wants to say, none of us are, the, we're, we're all of us Christians, and we're all of us the church, how? By the utter mercy of God. So there are three uh, answers to the question, how do we find the church? One answer is the evangelical answer, is the congregation of the, congregation of the faithful. Second answer is the Roman Catholic answer, which is, or the Catholic or Orthodox answer, which is, it is the visible body of Christ that has continuity through history and can be uh, discerned by its, by its visible structure, by its continuity of ministry, and by its, uh, um, by its sacraments. And then there are, there's, the, there's the Pentecostal or charismatic answer that says, how can you tell where the church is? It's where people are alive in the spirit. 
And Newbigin says all of these answers have um, um, all of these answers have a scriptural basis, but they are all uh, incomplete in themselves. Um, the evangelical uh, uh, um, emphasis on the gospel uh, is, a, is a proper emphasis, but it, it, can, it, it, can, it, can, it can sever the proclamation of the gospel from the body that proclaims it and become individualistic. And it can also uh, have an emphasis on an individualized soteriology at the expense of God's act in Jesus Christ to recreate the human race and create a new, you know, create a new, a new, a new, a new community. And I think that this is one of the, for me, this is one of the real big issues, which is that if we are, you know, Newbigin says this, we tell people that who they are in Jesus Christ is the most important fact about their life, and we tell it to them again and again from this divided platform. And we are telling them that the reconciler has come, but we who are telling them this are not reconciled. That so, so, you know, it has to be not only a message, it has to be a reality. It has to be something that you can enter into and live in. I'm going through this very quickly. So um, here, here's this thing, it's his uh, emphasis on the Catholic. He says the Catholics are right that there's a visible body. If we're going to join ourselves with Christ, we've got to join ourselves to the body. Um, he says the Catholic is right on, in, 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 on, in insisting that the continu continuity of the church is God's will. But he is wrong when he suggests that the doing of that will is the condition of our standing in his grace. As for the individual, so also for the church, there's only one way to be justified, and that is to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's his basic sort of critique of um, what he, what, if I could borrow a phrase from a theologian named George Hunzinger, an enclave theology, Hunzinger talks about, about academic theology, which is where some other thing in the gospel is the criteria then he talks about enclave theology, where you're a five-point Calvinist and you're watching for the uh, Arminians to come across the trip wire and you mow them down. You know? <laughs> and then he talks about ecumenical theology, which is theology which is in service of the coming unity of the church. You know? And uh, uh, Newbigin's critique of all enclave theology is that it is making some, is trying to create some platform to stand on other than the utter mercy of God. So the Pentecostal Christian, which is the other answer, has the New Testament on his side when he demands of any body of Christians, uh, do you have the Holy Spirit? Creedal orthodoxy and historic succession without the living spirit avails nothing. For the church lives neither by fullness, faithfulness to her message nor by abiding in one fellowship. She lives by the power of the Spirit of God. But the Pentecostal um, uh, while having a proper emphasis on the living spirit of God uh, and the fellowship of the spirit uh, uh, is inattentive to what has been given. The faith is a gift. It has been given. And what has been given is a gospel. What has been given is sacraments. And what has been given is a visible, is a visible body. So I'm going to just go to my final slide here. I know we're running out of time. Uh, so here is the, the eschatological dimension. So each of these three streams witness to a dimension of the essay of the what's essential or the being of the church. But because of their focus, each one cannot admit that the other one is, um, uh, is valid without unchurching itself. So there's the problem. So we're never going to solve this problem in terms of our conviction now. We're only going to solve this problem by uh, common repentance. And he, one of the things that Newton says about ecumen ecumenicity is the unity of the church requires death and resurrection. And he's against any kind of a cheap ecumenism which doesn't require us to in some way die. And he says, not only are we going to have to die to things, we all have things that are bad, that are wrong, that need to be corrected and reformed in our tradition. Not only are we going to have to die to that, but we're going to have to die to some things that are treasures in our tradition as well. Because in order to renew the church, God requires death and resurrection. So let me just give you the final. So here's the final look. Our task, firstly, is to call upon the whole church to a new acceptance of the missionary obligation to bring the whole world to obedience to Christ. And that's going to be visible, palpable, discernible. 
Secondly, to do everything in our power to extend the area of cooperation between all Christians in the fulfillment of that task by seeking to draw into the fellowship of the ecumenical movement those who at present stand outside it to the right and to the left. And thirdly, to press forward unwearingly the task of reunion in every place until all who in every place call upon the name of Jesus are visibly united in one fellowship, the sign and instrument of God's purpose to sum up all things in Christ, to him with the Father and the Holy Spirit be all the glory. Amen. Thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Joel and Leander, and uh, my good friend uh, Justin, and John, and uh, Rod, and, uh, and uh, everyone that uh, has been such uh, good friends of mine here over the years. And uh, I want to uh, say how much I appreciate being here and, and the endeavors that uh, Trinity is doing to uh, infuse this seminary with a, a great sense of pollinization of of bringing uh, diverse uh, uh, groups in and to expose you all to uh, the depth of what the Christian family looks like. And today it's an extraordinarily important topic uh, because I think we all realize that we're very unscriptural the way we practice our Christianity today. We certainly have not uh, taken seriously Christ's admonition uh, that we all be one and the brokenness of the body of Christ is to be lamented. Uh, for that it represents great, great sinfulness on our parts. And it's partially due for the fact that we take seriously the things which are not serious. And we have divided the body of Christ over issues of our own uh, personal preference, uh, rather than being scriptural or biblical or uh, uh, adhering to the witness of Christ. In this uh, particular few minutes that I have to, uh, to speak to you, I've provided just a, a quick overview for you. And I don't have time today, but maybe at another occasion, to address these in more depth. But to understand the Lutheran family, and in some ways we uh, have to acknowledge our blame in this whole thing, uh, because the brokenness of Christ um, is, is a partial part product of the of the Reformation, although not completely so. Uh, those of you who are studiers, who are students of uh, early first century Christianity know that the body of Christ was divided right from the get-go, and that there were great uh, contentious uh, adversarial uh, actions of uh, one group of Christians against another, and in fact, uh, the great ecumenical creeds that were developed were in response to the brokenness of the church in the very first centuries. In fact, the first four to five centuries of Christianity, uh, going up through Constantin uh, the Constantinople creeds and, and Nicaea in 325 and so forth, are all representative of this, uh, this fractious nature of the early church. So uh, although we can point a great deal of uh, our fingers, number of our fingers, to, to perhaps the Reformation, uh, as, uh, as Phil, my great colleague Phil knows, uh, this is, a, is an old story and, and one that's sadly being repeated. Someone once said, and, and Phil knows better than I, that, that, that worldwide there may be as many as 40,000 denominations. 40,000 denominations. Um, we should cry over that. Because what that represents is uh, the human spirit dominating over the Holy Spirit. Because certainly that isn't what Christ would wish, nor ever envisioned. His church, as he calls it the body of Christ, he calls it the bride of Christ. His most precious object uh, of his affection would be the church that he would leave, and those who would follow in his sacred name. And so we all have a lot of guilt to, to share, as Leander so well uh, represented in the stocks. Uh, a friend once uh, was called to a, uh, uh, a gathering, an ecumenical <coughs> gathering at an Episcopal church, and he called the rector, it was to be held in January, he called the rector and he said, what color stole should I wear? And uh, the director said, well, we wear green during Epiphany, and the Lutheran pastor said, well, that's strange, we wear white. Uh, and the rector says, well, no matter, we're going to celebrate the conversion of St. Paul, and uh, we wear white for that, so we'll be in sync. 
To which the Lutheran pastor answered, well, that's strange. We wear red. Uh, now, those are the kind of uh, adiaphora that Luther called adiaphora, things of no concern to the Christ, that we have divided the church over, that kind of thing. Little picayune uh, things of, of no matter, no concern. So in the ecumenical dialogues that have been held in Helsinki and Lund, which the Roman Catholics and Lutherans have been involved in for most of this century, uh, have centered rather on the things which hopefully really count. And if we can look on our, on our outline that I've provided, the Lutheran Church feels very strongly that the church, the body of Christ, must be uh, Christ-centered, obviously, and not human-centered. It has to be scripturally based, for that is normative of our faith, uh, doxological, uh, Trinitarian, we might say, uh, doxological, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the, you know, the essence of the Trinity, uh, creedal, that we do subscribe to the church fathers and their wisdom under the Holy Spirit that have developed uh, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian explication of the work of the Holy Spirit, and that those things represent a kind of collective conscience, but also a, a divine, divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit to come by them, and so they aren't to be ignored. As you know, many churches uh, cast out the creeds. They pride themselves in being non-creed. Well, we're a non-creedal church. Why, why would we say a creed? Well, then what do you believe? What, what's your statement of faith? Well, we don't have one. We just, we just worship and, you know, uh, have, have sort of a wonderful experience. Well, that is also to deny the wisdom of the ages, uh, to assume that the church fathers had nothing to say uh, to begin a church and to cast out all of the tradition of the Western church in our, in our case uh, seems to be uh, an offensive kind of thing, to assume that knowledge has nothing to, to say to our faith, that the church fathers had uh, nothing to contribute, that the creeds were simply then and were here now. Um, something's wrong with that kind of formula because I think we all uh, would subscribe here at least in, in a more traditional seminary to the fact that the Holy Spirit has worked in the church from the get-go and the products, the best products of human intelligence and these statements have been the products by which the Holy Spirit has concretized what we believe and what we think. So confessional is another point for Lutherans that we have confessions of faith, that we have statements uh, of doctrine. Uh, we also are a strongly liturgical church because we believe that to have formulas of worship um, help us not stray off into personal agendas. Uh, the wisdom, I think, of Cranmer's uh, prayer book is the fact that the prayers are for the ages. And although they may not be the way we always pray, they certainly are a place in which we can always find good thoughts, well-written, and then well-spoken. Sometimes I think you've been in experience in which uh, you, there is no formal prayers at all, and people just sort of ramble on and ramble on of personal agenda and so on. Uh, and certainly we won't don't want to take away from the spontaneous prayer, but nonetheless there is great wisdom again conveyed through the, the wisdom of the prayer books, be it the Book of Common Prayer, the Lutheran Book of Worship, etc. So we're liturgical. We feel that there's certain propriety in the way things are done. That the Lord's Supper, for example, should never be slap dab. You know, it shouldn't be, well, let's have the Lord's Supper, let's just have pizza and coke. And we'll consecrate the pepperoni and, and, you know, you pour the Coke and that's communion. I don't think so. I think when we look at Scripture, there was a, a wisdom in Christ uh, passing the cup and the breaking of the bread. Now, it's not impossible that under an extraordinary, extraordinarily extraordinary situation that we couldn't abridge that. But why would you do that? And what does that say to the greater Christian community when you sort of do your own thing, set up your own church, provide for your own liturgy, etc.? Now, liturgies grow out of community. 
Luther defined the church as when the people gather in common worship to proclaim the word properly delivered and to, and to participate in the sacraments. Word and sacrament has acknowledged the Lutheran church. So those things need to be present and the liturgical forms convey them sacramentally. It needs to have a devotional life. That prayer is an essential component of what makes up the Christian experience. If you have no communication with God, you're not interested in listening to what he says. And he speaks often in a still small voice, as the psalmists tell us. Then you are robbing yourself of that, uh, that communication by God, which is energizing, which is empowering, which, is, which makes life what it should and was meant to be. Uh, you know, it's the same thing like you bang on your television because it's not working. You kick it, you know, because if you kick it a little harder, it might start working. And then you look over and realize it's not plugged in. How did you expect to get a picture without having it plugged in and having it energized? How do you expect God to get into your life if you have no time for him? That's why we as Lutherans and you as Episcopalians and Anglicans uh, take very seriously the daily office. I, I fall, Justin was terrific today on his time management because that's exciting. He, he and I fly our emails back at 7 a.m. in the morning. And, and I, I go to my emails and all my correspondence. First thing I get in the office at 7. And then at 7.30 to 8, the daily office. I pray the daily office every day because that discipline grounds me in what I'm going to be doing the rest of the day. I need to be reminded who I am. I'm not just an executive operating. I'm a pastor of a congregation. I'm a called ordained servant of the Christ in whom I've loved all my life and to whom I've dedicated my life to serving. And I need to hear the witness of the text. I need to hear the Holy Scripture speaking to me that daily office forces me to look at texts I'd never look at otherwise in the three-year common lectionary on Sunday mornings. If you rob yourself of prayer, you deny yourself of an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So Lutherans feel strongly about that, the devotional life. It's communal. Christianity, the people that say, well, I'm a good Christian, I believe in Christ, and never, never come into a church or a community of faith. Um, I, can, I can worship just as well on the golf course. Yes, I suspect you can. There's a lot of mention of hell there. <laughs> but I don't believe that that was envisioned by the Christ to be the way we practice our Christianity in isolation. Separated from other people's input, uh, inspiration, uh, affirmation, encouragement, all of the things in which the Christian community uh, brings us into life. To hear the Word of God together, to pray together, to cry together, to dream together, and to have a passion. You know, uh, the word compassion applies, uh, is in the Bible so often, compassion. But I like to translate it into the, uh, the old Latin. Uh, the first word part is cum, cum, C-U-M, means with, with passion, with passion, with fire. To be so empowered by the Spirit to love God with your whole heart and soul and mind that you can't wait to go and proclaim the message to the community uh, abroad and to nurture the community within. It's experiential and it certainly is, as my colleague um, mentioned, we have to be missional. Now, to formulate all that, Lutherans have endorse the Holy Scriptures as normative for the faith, first, last, and always. Now, it doesn't mean that we put the Bible up and enthrone it and pray to the Bible as some amulet or some sort of, uh, have some sort of mystical power, but it is the living word through which God speaks to us and normative for our faith. We endorse the three great ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian. We've put all our documents of faith into what is known as the Book of Concord. We have in there, and all Lutheran students know these, 
the Luther Small Catechism becomes the study book by which we uh, study the scriptures and it directs them, uh, us in our growth, large and small. The Augsburg Confession are the corporate documents that put the Lutheran Church together in the first place and by which we operate uh, worldwide. Um, Beside the Anglican Communion, the Lutheran Church worldwide is the largest Protestant denomination in the world. Uh, and so we stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with our Roman Catholic brothers as a significant part of Christianity, as the Anglican Communion too. The Apology was written by Melanchthon. It was a further explanation, explication of the Augsburg Confession of Luther. And the Formula of Concord was, after all, the final break of the church uh, was put together in what Lutherans would, would see. Now it's interesting, Luther never wanted the word Lutheran connected with, the, with his church because he always, right to the end, firmly believed that uh, unity would be reestablished. The, the term that Luther preferred for the church or those that practiced outside the Catholic faith at his time was evangelical Catholic. We are evangelical Catholics, meaning that we are fully part of the church Catholic, but we have taken this proclamation move to be evangelical in the best sense of that word. And I think it's a wonderful a recovery of that terminology, and it's used in our ecumenical conversations. Luther had what he called the seven marks of the church. Uh, it's probably less known to most people, and if we had time I could talk further on this. They're very interesting, but uh, let me just go through them very quickly. Holy Word, Holy Baptism, Holy Eucharist, Holy Absolution, Holy Ministry, Holy Prayer, and Holy Cross. And I think even without explanation you can, you can get the feel of how he would explain each of those seven marks of the church. And where those seven marks are found, Luther said, you find the true church of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, Lutherans are, in the Augsburg Confession, there's a very interesting uh, statement. And that says that it is our hope and our desire, this goes back to the early 1500s, it is our hope and our desire that we will be soon back in the family of faith. Luther, I don't think ever, I think Luther would be horrified uh, if he realized what it has meant for everybody to just start their own church. Because Luther was a churchman, first, last, and always. His intention was to reform that which he loved, the church that he served and gave his life to. His reformation was never meant to destroy the church, but simply to improve it and to make those course corrections which he thought would bring it back to its true nature. Bill Witt, my colleague Bill Witt, would affirm those because I know that that's where he was, he was moving. And the discussions they had at Marburg and, and uh, the numerous conferences that they went to, conclaves, were ever attempts to put the body of Christ back together again. But the quirk of fate, with the printing press of Gutenberg, to disseminate these 95 theses of Luther across the Germanic lands, the politics of the time in which all the, the duchies and the counts and the princes were battling for control and, and human dominance, the disregard for the taxation of the papacy as they're building the St. Peter's, all these things went together to create this situation in which the Reformation got out of control. In fact, Luther, at one point after he left the Wartburg Castle and went back to his church at Wittenberg, where he had been pastor, he was appalled at what was happening there as he went across the Lutheran lands. And he saw people kicking out the statues, destroying the stained glass windows, ripping out the altars, ripping out all the symbolism of the church, and he was absolutely appalled. And he fired 
all his compatriots that were being so destructive to the institutional church because he believed that those things were part of the aids of our, of, you know, so Lutherans have wonderful music. Boy, where did Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote a mass for every Sunday of the church year. Unfortunately, uh, as Phil might know, you know, many of those were lost. Wouldn't you love to go back and find the ones that were never written down, were just done, you know, uh, extemporaneously. Okay, ecumenical divergence, and I'm going to uh, finish off here so we can have some discussion. The Lutherans are very interested in reuniting the body of Christ. And uh, we have had intensive uh, dialogue, discussions, and relations with Rome. It's very interesting that we call it crossing the Tiber, and some other people say coming home to Canterbury. Um, uh, but uh, it has always been the intention of the church to try to put uh, Humpty Dumpty back together again. So to speak. So uh, these discussions have been far reaching. And uh, the ELCA, of which I'm part, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is the largest of the Lutheran family in North America, uh, has signed some very significant ecumenical agreements. And one of the most significant ones were with you who are Episcopalians or Anglicans. Because we have now full communion agreements. Full communion means that we have interchangeability of clergy. My last uh, associate at St. John's was an Episcopalian. Still is an Episcopalian. I'm no longer there, but still an Episcopalian. Um, the large Episcopal church in our community has been served for a year and a half by a Lutheran pastor. The Diocese of Winnipeg in Canada just as elected, now get this, just as elected as dean of the cathedral, a Lutheran pastor. Isn't that interesting? Talking about the far range of, of dialogue. The Lutheran church has also signed in this country agreements with the Moravian church, Presbyterians, uh, United Methodists, United Church of Christ on greater or lesser terms, but with Anglicans and Episcopalians, it's full communion. Okay. Attached to this outline sheet, I put what I think will be an astounding thing for you to read. This is from the Diocese of the, or Synod of Virginia. And we have signed the same thing in Ohio. This is signed, if you look on the second or the back side of it, by the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, diocese, the Episcopal bishops, the Lutheran synodical bishops, there's a whole range of signatures here to this agreement. Now what is significant about this is how far ranging it is. If you know where Roman Catholics have been, perhaps not even recognizing us as legitimate churches, to signing a document which calls for full unity, visual unity. Do you understand what that means from the Roman Catholic side and from our side? That we're not just sort of uh, piddling around at the edges, but we're going right to the core of, of unity. On that covenant, and I'll just end here, if you look in the second paragraph, first line, after the preamble, Unity is a gospel imperative for the churches, not simply an option. That's extraordinary. Down under declaration, in the second paragraph, two decades of dialogues have led our three traditions, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, and Episcopal, or Anglican, to establish full communion as our mutual goal. Do you understand that? Do you understand the power of the Roman Catholic signing this document to full communion? That means going back to an undivided Western Church. That means that Lutherans and Episcopalians have said, yes, we will form to the best of our ability as time goes on and the Spirit empowers a united church. That is 
extraordinary. Extraordinary. To put it in print. To have this sent to the Vatican and not reject it. The last statement. Therefore, relying on the faithful love of the triune God, we commit ourselves to celebrate the unity already achieved through years of Lutheran, Anglican, Roman Catholic conversations and to strengthen, get the word here, visible unity of the body of Christ in Virginia. Now, this is not just an anomaly of Virginia. You could just say, well, there, you know, that's Virginia. But we've done exactly the same in north, northeastern Ohio. Our three bishops, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopal, have signed a similar document. This Reformation Sunday, get this, this Reformation Sunday, the Roman Catholic bishop is going to a Lutheran church with our Lutheran bishop to celebrate the Reformation. Imagine that. Imagine that about a year ago, the bishops exchanged. The Lutheran bishop presided at the Roman Catholic Cathedral, and the Roman Catholic presided at the Episcopal Cathedral. Significant? You bet it is. We're living in an exciting age where the body of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is beginning to do an extraordinary wonder in our midst. God bless us all. Notice the uh, picture here of visible unity. There we go. Step towards the future. <laughs> but um, this is an opportunity now, uh, the next 10 minutes or so, just to um, see what questions there might be that you may want to present to any one of these and uh, uh, a chance to clarify and, uh, and go further into what we've been saying. So, are there any uh, questions? I think there's a microphone coming around. So, if you have a question, I think we've got one uh, already coming up here. And that's Rebecca. So, over to you. Hi, I have a question for Joel. Um, your talk about Wesley's, Wesley's view on things is interesting. I was wondering if he had any sense of the, first, did he have any sense of the tragedy of not being in communion with others? Because you said he didn't seem to care about the physical unity aspect of it, but did he sense that the sacramental piece is something that's sad that that's not together? And also, at what point in his career did he write this piece? That's a good question. Um, Phil might be better on the dates than I, um, in terms of the, your, your second question. Uh, Mid-1800s, uh, things were pretty much in full swing by this point in terms of the renewal of the Methodist movement. Um, um, I'm thinking, uh, but I, I don't know where it plots in terms of his, his uh, development and his thinking. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this sermon is representative of the general theme of his thought on this issue and, and I, I, I don't think there's indication of a later shift away from it or something like that. Um, Wesley was a man of his time. This wasn't an ecumenical period per se. Um, so, so there's a sense in which we have to place Wesley within his own context. Um, I think Wesley was a committed Anglican. He was a 39 Articles guy. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say he didn't have a sense of great longing to, for example, reunify with Rome. Um, so um, so I, I, I don't, to my knowledge, uh, get a sense of Wesley um, being racked by remorse for this division. He, um, he really very clearly thinks that it's an inevitable fact that Christians will arrive at different judgments on these various things. Um, and that the greater tragedy is that we can't cooperate, uh, especially on the ground, with one another in, in, in ministry and mission. Uh, so. Thank you very much. I think Wally's hand is up next, and then Mary. I'm just, no, um, I'm, I'm just in utter shock that that Lowell would make this document I, signed in 1990. Is Benedict going to agree with this? And I'm, I just can't. I can't believe they would come 
half this harm. Yeah, the, uh, the documents are being signed all over the uh, United States like this and in Europe too. Uh, and I think it's a willingness on all the parts uh, to see. Uh, Pope Benedict, uh, you know, was a, a participant in the doctrine of justification uh, dialogues with the Lutherans. And if you know that that was one of the key Reformation uh, splitting points was over the doctrine of justification by faith. And uh, you also may remember that uh, Roman Catholics have signed on to a corporate agreement that basically the statement on justification by faith of Luther's was correct. And that statement, uh, Benedict was the participant uh, for Rome in those dialogues and a signer of that particular document. He also has uh, said uh, quite publicly that one of the key things of his pontificate is not only missionary zeal, but also uh, a unity. So he's made uh, you know, some great strides with the Orthodox and the dialogues with, uh, with Lutherans, uh, particularly continental Lutherans, are very strong. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I want first to confirm what you said and from my diocese one time, uh, a Catholic bishop was preaching in, in a diocesan location, education Sunday. But I also have a question from uh, the Lutheran mm -hmm. priest. Uh, as you are talking, in, uh, when you are introducing uh, the, your, your issue, you talked about uh, the issue of uh, 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 maybe doing the sacraments the right way and like Holy Communion. The African theologians nowadays are speaking about contextualization of the gospel and indigenization and using the things that are common and that are there, like uh, maybe not using wine, which you have to import from or export from places and it has an implication of uh, economy and using the locally available issues, what would be right. your well, comment? Well, I, I said yes, certainly context would, would be important and, you know, situations uh, develop. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm permitted by our canons to, if I'm in a hospital and I don't have my holy oils or anything like that and I have to do an emergency baptism, I can dump the flowers out of the vase and use the water that the flowers have been in. Or, or, you know, worse situation if there's a cup of, you know, a cup of coffee there, if that's the only thing, and I have to do a baptism emergency, I'll use the coffee. Well, that wouldn't be normative. Uh, but, I mean, can you imagine somebody said, I, can you imagine somebody saying, I had a coffee baptism, what was yours like? Oh, I had Coke. Uh, let me uh, say one other thing about sort of practical application of, of what we've talked about nationally or, or you know, ecclesi ecclesiology, uh, you know, ecclesiastically. Uh, in our particular parish, St. John's in Youngstown, we're a downtown, old historic downtown church. And we're, we've committed ourselves to living out the ecumenical witness. And so I've had four associate uh, pastors or rectors. Only one has been a Lutheran. The other one was a Greek Orthodox priest who left the largest Greek Orthodox church in our community, found St. John's, and we mentored him into Lutheran orders. But while we were mentoring him over that three and a half years, he was my associate. And I said to him, uh, Nick, Nicholas, obviously Greek, you know, Greek Orthodox, uh, you have tremendous gifts to give us as a parish. And so he introduced to us things like the fasting, uh, which is in the Orthodox tradition, iconology, icons. We now have an icon in our parish, two in fact. Um, and a lot of the devotional life and patristics. He taught, for example, to our congregation, the Church Fathers patristics, which as Lutherans in my seminary training, we were very light on. The third, Bill's, it goes to Bill's heart there. Uh, see, Bill? Uh, and uh, the third associate I had was Roman Catholic. Uh, Father Pizzuto uh, came to us from Sacred Heart Parish, and I mentored him into uh, Lutheran orders while he was still functioning, partially still within the Diocese of Youngstown. And as a Roman Catholic priest, 
And so he brought much of the rich, rich tradition within Catholicism, a devotional life. Introduced us to a, a much deeper sense of who Mary is, of which most Protestants have given sort of short shrift. So out of the but four, Luther. yeah, yeah, but not, yeah, but not, but not Luther, yeah. right, right. So actually, we've had four associates. I've had four associates: a Lutheran, an Episcopalian, uh, an Orthodox, and a Roman Catholic. Now, what that's done for the parish is amazing because it's brought a toleration and understanding and appreciation of others' ways of worship and understanding the Christ. And it has deepened our spirituality just immensely. We've got time for just one final question. I'm going to wrap up and head off to our advisory group. So who has the last question? I think the last question goes to Doug. I'm going to bring the microphone up. Can you? Oh, I'll <laughs> um, around this whole uh, topic, something that has been that I've been seeing in North American culture, is, is particularly over the last couple of months, is a shift in um, parts of evangelicalism to bring uh, a desire to bring Mormonism into this conversation of ecumenism. And um, I, I'm wondering if. Uh, any of the three who could comment on that shift, um, which, which, which to me feels very new, and obviously the presidential election is a catalyst for that, but it seems like that's going to be a very real conversation that the church is going to have to have. So. It's not very long. No. <laughs> well, I, think the, I, think the challenge, I think the challenge of this, uh, I mean, here are people who are interested, seriously interested in Jesus Christ. We have to say that. Here is a large numbers of people who are very seriously interested in Christian life, and 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 who arguably can, arguably, you could say that uh, this uh, ecclesiastical body, uh, as 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 a whole, when stacked up against other ecclesiastical bodies as a whole, in terms of obedience to the dictates of Christ, they come out looking pretty pretty good, pretty well, but ethically, 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 and morally, and so forth. Um, so I mean, certainly there's got to be a dialogue that is that is that is open there, but uh, <clears throat> ecumenical theology is grounded in soteriology, and there is no way to really push the ecumenical agenda forward without real clarity about who Jesus Christ is and what He's come to do. Right, and so that would be the sticking point in my view. Yeah, and that was my point in this outline of how we see the church and the historic nature of the church being grounded in the creeds, the confessions, the historic documents. And as I said in the early part of my talk, not to throw that simply out and start, you know, at square one, but to realize that the Holy Spirit has been working amazingly through the church, through its, its you know, its saints, its martyrs, its people of wisdom, men and women. Uh, and so the great glory today is that we're inheritors of all this rich heritage. It's now in our hands to see what we do about it. Just the, the counterexample, I think, would be what has happened to the historic ecumenical movement, which has completely blown up and de deconstructed itself. Ec ec ecumenical e effort now is really Grass more is grassroots. But what happened was there was an actual substitute of growing clarity around confession of Christ as the center of the ecumenical movement, and, what, and that was decentered. And what was substituted for the center was collaboration and good deeds. That's right. And the result of that has been the actual breakup of the mainline churches. And I, there's a little, I wrote an article about, uh, Leslie Nubian had a, a book review um, about this called The Amnesia of the Mainline Churches. And it's in our, uh, I, I did a thing on it in our little uh, thing on uh, uh, Nubigan. But that would be, so that would be my worry about this, this emerging conversation. If it follows that model, that's not going to bring unity, that's going to bring disunity. I just want to recommend a book for those of you who are interested in kind of questions of practical ecumenism, local ecumenism, how uh, the sort of thing that Wesley was talking about might work on the ground. And it actually has a lot of convergence with what Leander was saying about Newbigin's vision, and that is, Your Church is Too Small by a man named John Armstrong. Um, it's very much focused on this idea of the church of a particular locale being all those churches within that locale and a vision for how they can actually
come together uh, for a common mission. That's it. Well, I want to thank our three presenters for excellent.